This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our future guest today, Doug Jones. Doug, are you ready for your close-up? Oh, right, yes. Yes, in, in the, in the uh, sun, Sunset Boulevard style, I'm ready for my close-up, yes. <laughs> Doug Jones is a veteran of film acting with roles in major box office hits, such as Hocus Pocus, Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, Hellboy, and his Oscar-nominated sequel, Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, an Oscar-winning Pan's Labyrinth, as well as the Emmy-nominated TV series, Falling Skies, and the Golden Globe-nominated TV series, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He is renowned for his roles in the science fiction, fantasy, and horror genres, often wearing heavy makeup to play non-human characters. Doug, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Oh, gosh. Well, thank you so much for having me. And that's the best introduction ever. Really? <laughs> well, I, you know what? I'm, I'm, that's just made my day. I'm like <laughs> all blasted now. Um, Doug, I am just so excited to have you on the show because I feel that, you are so unique within this industry. Um, your body of work is really unlike pretty much anyone else that, that I can think of in, in just all of these incredible creatures and, and characters that you've brought to life. And so I feel like this is going to be a particularly fascinating show for a lot of people as you, um, you have a craft and an art that is, um, is very unusual. It's very unique. Um, and in a, in a world where there's so much um, repetitiveness um, within the film industry and within the media. That's just, I think, a very refreshing thing for a lot of us. So I definitely want to get into chatting with you about uh, creatures and monsters and miming and all that good stuff. But before we do so, I just love for our audience to find out a little bit about how you first got into the industry because obviously the job you have now is not, an, a normal or an average job. So I just think it'd be really interesting to kind of find out how you went from not being in the industry to where you're at today, you know, within this very unusual niche that you're in. Right. Well, how I got into the industry and how I evolved in the industry are two different, different little stories. But uh, the getting into the industry part um, – was, uh, you know, I was a, 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 an awkward uh, child growing up in the Midwest in Indiana. Like a lot of people uh, who enter the showbiz, I, I felt like I was the only oddball in my entire school. Yes. And <laughs> so I, had to, I developed a sense of humor so that I could, uh, I, could, I could control when people made fun of me because I was, I was doing it for a laugh or whatever, right? Yeah. So, um, so that, that, trans, that, the end, that, that early inspiration, you know, to, to be funny, uh, I, I got all my, all, a lot of my material from I Love Lucy and the Dick Van Dyke Show and the Carol Burnett Show and uh, Donnie and Marie and Sh Sonny and Cher and like uh, Gilmer Pyle, Gilligan's Island, just like tons of like sitcoms mm. and variety shows were my yeah. thing. And uh, so that translated uh, into this tall, skinny, goopy boy uh, rather well. And so um, I got lots of encouragement from people. Yeah, hey, you're so funny. You should be on stage all the time. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so uh, after doing a, uh, getting my degree in college with a, a radio and TV broadcasting major and a minor in theater, um, I ended up uh, uh, marrying the lovely Mrs. Laurie and moving out to Los Angeles in 1985. Uh, so that I could take a job at a bank, which the bank job was, was not my, my goal. It was basically the excuse to move so that I would have employment when I got here to yeah. Los Angeles. And uh, once the bank realized that I was not a banker, they fired me after eight months, which they should have. <laughs> I, I was horrible. Well, um, if you manage to hang on for eight months, that's pretty good. I think I did. Well, I faked my way for eight months. Yes, thank yeah, you. Like thank that's you. That, that like, what an that's, actor I can be. Yeah, I know. That's a pretty amazing acting job because I <laughs> feel like if I got a job as a banker, I wouldn't make it through eight days. All right. <laughs> exactly. So that's, I, I shocked myself even. I know. Um, so... Uh, so I um, uh, then then being let go, it's like oh huh. Well, I guess uh, you know I'm, I um, 
I'm now unemployed, but I was getting unemployment checks from the from the unemployment system here, and and uh, Mrs. Laurie was working as a receptionist at an advertising agency, so we were scraping by, mm-hmm. and thought, you know, uh, we moved here for me to be an actor. Let's give that a shot while we're we, while we have this chance with no yeah. responsibilities, and you know, there we go. So um, I started uh, looking through the um, the trade papers at the time. We didn't have the internet back then. This is the 80s, right? Yeah. So <laughs> the right. dog so you, ages. Right. So you can't look online to find out, you know, what does an actor do to start? You had no, you didn't have that resource. Mm. So there was a, a weekly magazine, a, a newspaper tabloid that came out called Drama Log, which is now called Backstage. And uh, and that was once a week. It had casting notices in it, everything from, from freebies for student films to paid gigs for corporate videos or maybe hard to cast things in TV and film. And uh, and then you also had advertisements in there for everything from acting classes to photographers to anything actor resources would all be in there. So um, I started submitting myself for you know anything I could get get my face in there, and uh, and I um, I got some advice from an actor that said that he told me to start with um, TV commercials uh, because if I wanted to, I needed to get my Screen Actors Guild membership. Uh, and in order to get into the union, you couldn't do it with the three voucher system for extra work back then. That was not covered by SAG, AFTRA. Uh, so you had to, you know, get a principal role, get cast in something as a principal character. Um, and as an unknown, you had a better chance at commercials than anything else. So yeah. I was like, okay, so I took that advice to heart, and I focused on TV commercials. So I looked in this Dramalogue magazine to find who would let me audit a, a, a TV commercial acting workshop for free uh, so that I could decide you know, where I want to actually start paying for classes. Five of them let me come aud- uh, audit a class for free, and I went back to the one that made sense to me. And so that, that, that acting teacher was Philip Carr, and he's, uh, God rest his soul, he passed on uh, many years ago now. But um, he, was the, he was the roly-poly New York sense of humor kind of guy, uh, out here in LA, who he kind of got me, uh, and not everybody gets me. <laughs> so he, <laughs> you could tell he was a kind of an acting instructor who would cultivate what you have instead of trying to break it down and then build something new up. Yeah. Um, I, I liked I liked his style very much, and, and he he got my sense of humor, and and we we got each other. So um, I went back and started taking more cl- classes from him and paid for them, and. At the end of my second class with him, he said, do you have an agent yet? And I said, I don't know what an agent is. <laughs> so he said, well, here, here's my card. Call me at the office. Turns out that he was the uh, vice president of Wilhelmina Agency, which is a huge modeling agency in New York. Mm. And they had a West Coast office with a huge TV commercial department. And he said, uh, give, me a, give me a call there. And, and I did. And I went in and met with all the other agents. They all love me. And thank heaven for that. We that became my first agency. So they started sending me out on all kinds of commercial auditions. Mm. And um, that, now what, what they liked, uh, not only did they like that I was a tall, skinny, goofy character kind of guy in the yeah. modeling agency, because otherwise they had enough pretty people as it was. Yeah, I was going to so, say, were they tapping you for being a male model? <laughs> know, right. It's like, how Hardly. good are you at Blue Steel? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I was, kinda, I was unique in that agency for sure. Yes, and, yes, uh, you have that, such unique look. No, Which we'll is think. a blessing because I think a lot of actors do believe that, you know, man, if I'm going to make it as an actor, I need to look like Brad Pitt or, you know, Liam Hem- Liam Hemsworth, Hemsworth or someone right, like that. Right. And, and there is something to be said for, well, actually, if you have a great, unique look, oh, yeah. there's going to be so many directors and producers that want that. They don't want everyone in their movie to just look like a carbon copy version right. of one another. Right. Celebrate your, your uniqueness, I would yeah. say, for sure. And so I, I did learn that at an early age to, to just to celebrate the tall, the skinny, the goofy. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, but on my resume, of course, was experience as a mime and a contortionist. And those two things, for some reason, uh, sparked an awful lot of casting uh, inquiries for me. Really? Um, right. 
like anything, any kind of. So you're like a it. fully professional contortionist, or no? I have. I can put my legs behind my head. It's a party trick. That's my one. I'm a one trick pony. Hey, that's uh, better. That's better than most people can do. I don't think I've done that since I was about three years old. So right. yeah, you should age out of it, but for some reason I didn't. So really? do you still <laughs> can, do it? I can still do it. Yeah. No way! Wow. So, crazy right that's like so, slightly freakish <laughs> yeah freak of nature yeah but uh but for some but that 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 uh makes you interesting on the casting circuit yeah but, um so anything that required physical tomfoolery or a sight gag or uh, wearing costumes makeups and, and creature suits that were, they ask for mind experience for that kind of thing so mm. i started going out on a lot of auditions that involved that yeah and yeah uh, so early in my commercial career was uh, my very first commercial that I booked and that get, got me into the Screen Actors Guild. And, uh, and my, first, my first commercial credit was a, a Southwest Airlines commercial that I played a dancing mummy in. <laughs> I was boating the things to come. Yeah, so I was going to say. <laughs> so then, then I did a commercial for Bob's Big Boy after that as a, as a nerd with like plaid pants and a pocket protector and the, the funny glasses. And then my, I think it was my third commercial booking no, my fourth. I, then I did a, a, an alien commercial, a, an alien from outer space for a, a toy commercial. Uh, uh, and the creature effects makeup people that made that alien costume were also the ones who made uh, the crescent moon head for a very popular McDonald's campaign called Mac Tonight. The character was Mac Tonight. Mm-hmm. And that casting for that happened right after I did my the alien commercial. And so when I came in, I already knew the creature effects people that, that were making the, the mask. And so they came, I came with a big referral from them. Yeah. And, uh, and I ended up booking this McDonald's campaign that turned into a huge campaign uh, mm. that went worldwide eventually. Mm. And so I ended up doing 27 commercials as this character for the next three years. And that was from like 19, wow. 1987 to 1991. So, uh, so that was just, you know, a really great coup for a young actor to fall in. My, my fourth commercial booking was that. Yes. Um, you know, my gosh. I, I bought my first house with that, right? So wow. That so, so was just great. Um, <laughs> so what came with that campaign, though, was a reputation of tall, skinny, goofy guy who moves well, wears a lot of crud on his face and body, and doesn't complain in the makeup. And that was the big yeah. one, right? Because <laughs> a lot of actors <laughs> are divas who, you know, will complain about anything. You know, there's, there's no yeah. joke out there. How do you make an actor complain? Give him a job. Right? Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Right. Well, so, um, Doug, you, obviously, you have this incredible body of work of playing these uh, fantastical creatures and monsters, and really the, the, the diversity of characters that you've played is, is pretty mind-boggling. I'd love to know what process you go through as an actor to bring that creature to life, because I know that m- most actors have a pretty, whether they're, they're Meisner or their method or they just go with gut instinct, whatever it is, they have a means of preparing for that role. And I'm just thinking, but how does one prepare when you're playing someone like the pale man or you know the fawn or or a character like that that just so completely defies um a typical human experience how how do you go about preparing emotionally and maybe even preparing physically for that role right well uh if you approach these fantastical non-human uh creatures from another world if you approach those characters the same way any actor approaches any character uh, that's the place to start, and um, um, because each each character you play, whether it's human or not, still has been written into that story for a reason, and for with with wants and desires and fears and shortcomings and strengths and mm. weaknesses and and uh, all of that and motivations. So, um, so you have to explore those, read the script, get the writer's intention, like like you would in, with any acting role. Um, Talk with your director. That's my next step: is to have a, a sit down with the director. Hopefully, if I if I have that luxury, to find out you know any quirks that or or, or nuances or personality traits they want to see in the character. How mm-hmm. what's their vision for him? And then uh, then now if it's a fantastical creature from another world, that's going to involve a lot of makeup. So I can start going through makeup and costume fittings and test sh- shoots and that kind of thing. 
And during that whole process of building the character physically on me, uh, that's when I see, oh, he's going to look different, or, oh, those fingers are longer than I normally would have thought, or that I have horns on my head, or, oh, look at that underbite, or any, any little quirk like that. Um, oh, I've got, webbed, I've got webbing under my arms. So I can only lift my arms so high. Uh, oh, stilts on my feet? I'm going to be seven feet tall. <laughs> I see. So there's, you, know, you find out so much information uh, from those fittings and from you know, seeing the actual physicality of what's going to be put on you. So you can start to develop how he moves, how, how yeah. and uh, so I, I might have have seen conceptual drawings of of a character in the early stages. Then at my 24-hour fitness gym, I'll go there after the aerobics classes are done for the day, <laughs> and use that dance floor and the mirrors, and and just start walking and squatting and lunging and and crawling or whatever the whatever the script called for to try to get an idea for myself of what might happen. And then the fitting start and. Then the, I can see how far I can take those those movements and how how much I can incorporate them, or how, how what are my limitations, or what are my exaggerations that the, this costume or, or uh, suit has has given me. Mm. So it sounds like for you, it's quite an outside in process. At least that's part of the process. Is it, it goes both ways. It, yeah, it, it, it's both. Honestly, uh, uh, like I said, it has to start with the inside. I find the heart and soul of the characters. That's an mm. inside working its way out thing. But then also with with makeup, a five hour makeup application being applied to you wow. from the outside, it does have to make its way in. Yeah. So I think I think there's there's an inside influence and an outside influence that meet in the middle somewhere yeah. with this kind of character for me. And typically, how long? I'm just asking because I realize that this is such a unique thing that um, even a lot of very seasoned actors most likely won't have gone through this process. I'm just wondering how long does that process typically start? before shooting in terms of is this like several weeks before or several months before because i mean that gestation of that character i would imagine that's a lengthy process before you even get to set to start shooting it can be right right but for instance now i'm I'm, I'm going to be doing a movie this uh a very hush hush project with guillermo del toro this coming (laughs) summer Uh, i don't start till late july and so here it is what february now yeah, and so I just went in recently to do a life cast, uh, so that the sculptor can start like creating the the silhouette and the look of this character's uh, head and shoulders, right? Yeah. So that's how many months between now and July. So there you go. Yeah, that's, uh, it's like a half, yeah, then, about so. a half a year. Right. I mean, he's. I think he. Um, I, I had the great blessing of getting to meet him a few years ago, and. It just struck me the level of his passion and his vision. I got to see his incredible, he'd brought one of his incredible books with Mm -hmm. his drawings in it. And you just realize the depth of his genius. I would imagine Mm -hmm. that he, he's, you know, he's not going to be the director. He's kind of like, oh, it's just a monster. I mean, for him, it's like, there's so much thought that goes into that. In terms of your working relationship with, with him, um, do you, do you kind of are you at the point yet where you get to have some input on what that character is going to look like, or is it very much just the director's domain? I, well, I think it's really. In, in, it, I like to think that it should be the director's domain. Yeah. Myself. I'm not one. Of, there are some actors that come in with lots of ideas and lots of suggestions and lots of you know I think it should be like this because <laughs> you know most actors are very self-absorbed alpha type personalities. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm I guess I'm not one of those. I'm I'm actually I respect the artists who who have created who create these looks on me so much that I would never try to um, pretend like I know their job better than they do yeah. ever. And I um, think when it comes to Guillermo del Toro, it's kind of a case yeah. of just keep your mouth shut and do whatever he says because he's a genius. Right. Right. He's, he's a, a and he also right. gives the world's best hugs. I truly believe um, he is a bear hugger for sure. He's an amazing yeah. hugger. It's like everyone in the industry deserves to have a hug by Guillermo del Toro at it's least true. once in their lifetime. Exactly. Um, though I've heard that I've actually heard that you give amazing hugs as well. From some well, of my I, friends. I do my darndest. Thank yes, you. Thank I you have. For... I have actually. I've heard that from a couple of different people, so it oh, kind of stuck very with me. Here. The, the, the reputation <laughs> exactly. precedes me. It's better than the reputation some people have in this industry, for sure. Um, I, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of um, that relationship, then with actually the people who are physically creating the character, do they typically are, are they the ones kind of? 
who are significantly dr driving the creativity of that or are they more just so executing literally what a direction is what a director has envisaged and and maybe sketched up Right. It depends on the director, I think. In yeah. the case of Guillermo del Toro, being the visionary that he is and having that sketchbook that you've seen that he mm -hmm. carries with him everywhere, uh, he'll draw pictures, he'll write notes, he'll, you know, uh, so he has, he comes in with very specific uh, things that he'd like to see in a creature in his movies. Yeah. Um, so in the makeup artists or the, the, and the creature designers, um, they'll take his notes, they'll take his early drawings, and then they'll, they'll create something from that, a conceptual drawing that they'll, they'll, they'll either make him, like, you know, salivate or make him go, eh, not quite what I had in mind, or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that, that's a very collaborative process between a director like him and mm. makeup people. Man, Other I directors, would... I would kill to be in that room. I'm like, oh right, right. Like that would just be like seeing genius take birth. I mean, my goodness, my goodness, what a what right. a treat. I I really I'm very envious of you because I think that you have undoubtedly one of the um, the funnest jobs on planet Earth. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you know, when your kids are going out for Halloween and you're and you're dressing up, it's it, what, it, that, of course that's fun. It's a night you live for. So yeah. it's getting it's Halloween. Is for, it's Halloween for you, just like hey, I dominate. Yeah, like well, Halloween no, is funny. every day for you. Well, you're right. When you, when you dress up every day for work, Halloween uh, now <laughs> I like to answer the door in a t-shirt with a bowl of candy. Yes. That's my <laughs> you know what I mean? it's like for Halloween, I'm coming as myself. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a tall guy with with, with the handing out candy at the door for sure. Oh. Oh my gosh! So, um, in terms of in terms of forward forward looking, do you really see um, yourself just continuing to do these incredible character roles, or do you do you really see yourself um, maybe wanting to do more more movies where we're seeing Doug Jones without ten ton of makeup on him? Right. Well, I. I uh... I have enjoyed both uh, mm. of late. I really have, and and I and I, uh, for me, uh, if it's a great character and a great story, I'll want to play him, whether it's with lots of makeup or not. It doesn't matter to me one way or another. Yeah. Um, but lately, uh, uh, I've had more people want to take a chance on my real face, which has been great. But you have this um, is a thing. You have such an incredible face. I mean, no. it's true. No, okay. truly, I just think you have one of them. I I'm one of those directors who really likes characters you know like mm -hmm. i think it's nice to have if you've got your leading guy to to have someone who has that kind of leading guy good looks but but i feel that there's such a value to having just a diversity of really really interesting looks and i think that you um yeah you have a look that's that's very very unique i don't feel like there's a ton of other actors that i go oh he's kind of like in that type you just are very much in your own category. Um, oh, well, thank so, you. You know, I, I, I'm, I've, I've, because I'm 55 years old now, I've, I've graduated into a bracket where, uh, as a character actor, where I, I'm cast a lot now as scientists and lawyers and <laughs> doctors and crazy, crazy, villains, crazy scientists. You know? <laughs> yeah, and or recently, uh, uh, just the, the uh, Hallmark Channel movie that I did called The Ultimate Legacy, where I got yes. to play a butler for. Uh, Raquel Welsh was my boss lady. Yes. And uh, my, my lovely sidekick was the, the head of maintenance for the estate was uh, played by Tori Martin. Uh, yes, we had a joint so friend of ours, a joint friend of ours, and an amazing, similarly, an amazing character actor, but a yes, character yes. actor that's like so different from you. I actually thought mm -hmm. that was a brilliant piece of casting just because you're, but both of you are like such caricatures that oh, visually we are, look we were, great. We were like Laurel and Hardy together. We were, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a great match. I would love to play with him on film again anytime. Oh gosh. Um, so yeah, our body types are so different. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought it, it worked incredibly well. Um, yeah. Well, Doug, you've had an incredibly long and illustrious career. I would love to know what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far in your career, and how did you turn that situation around? Mm. Probably, uh, it was—it's an ongoing battle, uh, but 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 I, but, I, we're, but we're winning the battle for sure. Mm. Um, biggest biggest challenge for me when so much makeup has been dumped on my face, where I'm un, unrecognizable in certain roles, um, was being recognized by the studio system, by yes. agents, managers, by journalists, even. Uh, as an actor, not as a mime who turned into a stuntman who maybe is a movement specialist. Yeah, like maybe... the guy who's in the suit. You know? 
Right, right, and there's even there's even a title that that creature effect houses have given actors who do it called suit performers. Oh gosh, and, that's and dreadful. That's, and and that's not a title that I really own. Um, yeah. I don't like to be called a suit performer because I am an actor, and it takes an actor to take on a character, whether in a suit or not. And I think that so, there is that misconception that oh, it's just a guy in a suit, and so long as he doesn't hit the furniture, that's kind of all he's doing. And yet, right, exactly. when you know when 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 one looks at at um, like Pan's lab. Labyrinth, as as much as I'm sure it was an incredible feat for you to be able to move the way that you did, you do realize that that miming that you did, I mean, particularly, I just loved, I was actually just watching yesterday, again, some extracts of uh, The Pale Man, and it's just so powerful, the way you use that movement, the way you use your hands it's oh, to, to me, it's just such a, in many ways, such a greater challenge than if we can see your face and see your voice and you don't have all of these huge impediments to be able to do what you're doing. I mean, the, the fact that you're able to move so fluidly and evocatively in the midst of a, a outfit, a setup that, you know, I think anyone would have a hard time not stumbling around in, I think is, is to me, that's true artistry. Well, th oh, thank you so much. And I can see, and that spiel you just gave on my behalf. Thank you so much. That's the spiel that we have, the, the, and the message that that uh, my my agent and and uh, that we've been trying to convey to the yeah. studio system and to to journalists who interview me uh, along the way. Mm. Um, and and so to kind of revive that golden era when monsters were allowed to be movie stars, when you had the Bela Lugosi's yes. and you had the Boris Karloff's and the Lon yes, Chaney's. Yes, absolutely. We were missing that that sort of uh, 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 reverence for them. For many decades in the middle there, and then, uh, you know, with, with the exception of maybe, uh, you know, uh, Freddy Krueger played by Robert England. Yeah. Uh, but then, then, uh, you know, but, but then Pan's Labyrinth, I think, was the movie that really turned the page back for me uh, mm. to where where people were starting to call me an actor, and and they would call me a movie star, and they would not just call me the guy in the creature suit. Well, so, I mean, because those characters, I think, were such a seminal part of the story. Right. It wasn't just the oh, it's you know the. Th the the you know the the weird monster that's going to jump out at us they truly were these very captivating depictive um characters that that yeah. made the movie i mean it's it and it, again which we owe to guillermo del toro for sure yes well yeah. no, i mean he's and yeah. i'm i'm i have to say i'm just dying to know more about his new project but i know that you're not going to say a word to oh, me so i'm not I, even going to embarrass myself i probably by shouldn't even mention it. it's so secret yeah oh, <laughs> oh my gosh well um yes i'm like can i buy my ticket already like I know, right? <laughs> yeah it's just anyway um so um doug i would uh just really like to to get um some insight on whether you have like daily practices, things that you do every day that you really feel have contributed to your personal success, being that you have had this incredibly successful um, career in film, um, you know, are there other kind of rituals that you have every single day, or are you more so someone who just kind of goes with the flow? I'm kind of a go with the flow fella. Um, mm. I think it, I don't really have any rituals aside from. Uh, staying physical and agile and in the best shape that I can. For I would imagine that's a concern. Do you have to d be doing stretches every day and that sort of thing? But, well, uh, I, I don't, I'm naturally flexible. Thank heaven for that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know, uh, but keeping keeping my cardio exercise up and keeping yeah. my to be the strongest skinny man that I can be. Uh, again, I'm 55 <laughs> years old and that doesn't come as naturally as it used to. Yeah. So I, I do need to to work on that some. Um, and uh, but as far as like. Uh, staying prepared as an actor, there are some. It's different for everybody. Acting is such a psychological art that uh, everyone's going to give you a different answer on that. Uh, some would say you got to stay in class if you're not working. Uh, you know, if you're not filming something, then be in class. Mm. Uh, you know, constantly w w working your tool and your muscle. Uh, but for me, it's like mm, I I'm not a good class taker, so I yeah. I'm better. I'm better at living and observing life and, and interacting with real people socially. Yes. I get so much out of that uh, that, that transpires into my acting. Uh, yes. So, uh, well, it seems to me, though, that a lot of what you do, being that it's so unique, I would imagine does require a lot of observation of things that maybe other actors wouldn't even think to observe, like uh, the way that animals move, the you know, mm -hmm. th those kinds of things where it's like, 
you you're playing these characters that are almost like half animal that move in a way that isn't completely human i would i would imagine that in, inherently there's probably a maybe even on a subconscious level just a lot of observation of how animals move how people move yes no, absolutely um uh, right when you're in the hellway movies i'm half fish half man named <laughs> Adrian, and uh, so so that was a, a combination of, of just like observing the, the goldfish that were in the, my home office tank. Yeah. I, I was watching them, and, and with, I loved how their, their heads darted around curiously while their bodies flowed behind with such fluidity and, mm. and, and, and calm. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to incorporate that into my character. That's something you, I could never have learned in class. Music. Exactly. <laughs> right. Except, well, I just feel like so much of what you do isn't what the typical thing one's going to be workshopping in class. You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it would be a very it would be a very unique acting class. Um, you would be. <laughs> Doug, um, I would love to know what you think is the most important thing for our listeners to understand right now about the evolution of the film industry, and maybe even specifically about the evolution of your area of the film industry. So you were saying that that you are starting to see a progression out of kind of this this respect having been lost for actors who do what you specifically do, which is depicting these incredible characters. Um, how with this kind of like massive explosion of superhero movies, are you are you seeing some evolution there or or not? Yeah. Um, uh... Yes, I think that the the audience has has voted with their cash, with, yeah. their, with their tickets, buying power, uh, what they like to see, and um, and and the the comic book movies and the fantasy genres are just at an all time high, mm. um, and so 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 and with that comes technology too that that's ever evolving. Um, so not only are there are there practical makeups like like the old school days, but now the with the advent of computer graphics and CGI and visual effects houses, uh, uh, the, the, they've gone through waves of of thinking for a minute there that like it's all going to be CG now. We yeah, like we don't need effects. actors anymore. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> that, I have it, to say there are some days when that's strangely appealing. I know. <laughs> Right. I, I know many people would hate me for that, but there are, there is the odd day where it's like, you know what, if we could just punch a bunch of buttons, it'd be so much easier. Right, and and there have been those projects that have done that, right? That are, mm. uh, that, that are uh, like, um, oh, uh, uh, Beowulf, for instance. Yeah. Which was a, a 100% CG movie with, uh, uh, which was it was a fun experiment. It was it was interesting to watch, but I I wouldn't want to watch every movie like that. No. And again, the audience is voted by by saying, you know. When I do the convention circuit out there, especially, and I meet fans one on one, I hear I hear from them repeatedly how much they love the old school practical effects. Mm. And uh, so, so I think that what we have now, we've settled at first. At first, there CG went at the advent of CG. It, everybody was going all CG characters, and then it looked too much like a video game for a minute. Yes. And then we pulled back to some practical again. So I think right now we've we've reached a nice mix out there where practical effects and visual effects are working together. Mm. Right? Where crazy, wonderful makeups, like in Crimson Peak most recently, for mm. instance, uh, where I played two of the ghost ladies that were haunting the mansion. Um, it was, I was in beautiful makeup designs that, that transformed me into ghost ladies. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, with, with I'm just I'm giggling because I'm just thinking, what a crazy job you do! Like when no, someone right? asks you what you do that, for a right? living, I play ghost ladies. What I other mean... six foot three, one hundred and forty pound guy oh can gosh. say I was two ghost ladies in a do you have Do you have film. like Do you have like little kids in your family to whom you're just like the crazy unique relative? So, well, my my five nieces grew up with Uncle Dougie stories for yes, sure. Yes, I can yes. imagine. I can yeah. imagine. Anyway, yeah, it was sidetracked. But, but. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that that's a, we're at a place now where, where CG enhancements on those makeups are making things possible that we couldn't do before. Yes. Uh, so that, that, that's been a nice turn of events. Mm. I think the other, the other thing with, with the movie industry in general, uh, to stay flexible and to stay evolving with it, is all of the different mediums that there are to work in now, all the different portals. Um, anybody can can be a movie company now because of things like YouTube and yeah. and, um, and Vimeo and uh, and and how you can get a film look on a, on a, on your iPhone now for crying I know, it's out loud. Crazy. So the film you know filmmaking is is more accessible to to the civilian out there now. Uh, so uh, so to uh, to keep yourself present in all of those mediums is uh, is rather key now. You know, mm. it's not back in the old days when I started. Um, a, a movie actor would have to think really hard and, and long about doing a TV show.
show because that would be a reputation. Yes. Order, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's like you know you've got huge movie stars doing web series, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like it's it, 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 you have to be open to all of it now. I yeah. Think. That's that's how where we've evolved to. Yeah. Well, Doug, we're about to enter our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before Hmm. we do so, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. When you're putting together that masterpiece movie, the coloring is a major creative decision. It can make the difference between whether the audience interprets your story as warm, cold, dark or light, and it can help define the genre of the film. Here's a quick tip. Horror movies tend to have blue tones. Romantic comedies tend to have warm tones. Apocalyptic movies tend to be grey and washed out. Movies in which reality is off kilter tend to have green tones. And action movies tend to feature a lot of teal and orange, particularly in their artwork. The Emmy Award winning Da Vinci Resolve from Black Magic will help you get that perfect colour for your next production. The DaVinci Resolve 12 combines professional non-linear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So you can now edit, color correct, finish and deliver all from one system. The DaVinci Resolve is completely scalable and resolution independent, so it can be used on set, in a small studio, or integrated into the largest Hollywood production pipeline. From creative editing and multi-camera television production to high-end finishing and color correction, only DaVinci Resolve features the creative tools, compatibility, speed, and legendary image quality that you need to manage your entire workflow, which is why it is the number one solution used on Hollywood feature films. Doug, welcome to the final act where you'll be showing incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? Oh, wow. I hope I, can live. <laughs> I, hope I have mind-blowing answers for you. Well, you know, not to hype things up too much, but mm. um, <laughs> um, Doug, what is the best advice you've ever received? Uh, let's see. This is going to be rather simple. Uh, the best advice I ever received was Get a really good blue plaid shirt to audition in. <laughs> right? Really? Why? Why <laughs> blue? Was, uh, Why plaid? It's because I, 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 when I was starting to do TV commercials, um, I was a, very much a Midwestern grown character actor oh, with a good old boy right. next door kind of a look. Yeah. And a, a plaid shirt with blues that would play off my eyes and my coloration. Yeah. That's what I've ever got. <laughs> so, I thought um, you were going to say something like, make sure you go to the bathroom before you put the suit on. Oh, no, that's, that's advice I give now. I, mean, I, I never got that advice. <laughs> I had to like, learn that the hard way. I cannot even imagine. Like, I'm just envisaging, like, some kind of stadium master type device. <laughs> I mean, it must, be, it must be really difficult when you're like, yeah. guys, I have to go. Like, you need to get the right. seat off of me. Right, right. Um, but, gosh. No, but with, with the blue plaid shirt advice, though, what, what, what that really, uh, it's the bigger picture that that implies, which is know your type, I think. Yeah, yes. Um, that, and that is, I, you know, I, I knew that I was not a Tom Cruise. I'm not a Brad Pitt. I am a goofy <laughs> guy that would wear a plaid shirt and be like the sidekick to those yes, handsome fellows. Yes. That's fine. And that's worked for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. I was reading um, actually just yesterday some advice that was saying that when you know who your star is going to be in a movie to really, the best thing you can do as a writer is to write to their strengths. Watch. Right watch their footage, figure out what makes them at their best because Mm -hmm. every actor has things that they're better at than others and then write to those strengths, which I thought Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely advice that's given a lot to actors, but it was probably the first time I'd so directly heard that advice to a writer or a a director, um, which I think kind of speaks to that whole point. Um, Mm -hmm. Doug, if you had just one movie to stake your entire career on, (laughs) <laughs> what kind of movie would it be and what talent would you want attached? You know, um, uh, if I had answered this question two years ago, I would, I would be answering it like you, like you asked it, as, as, as a movie that has never been made before for mm-hmm. me. But now um, I actually can check this off my bucket list. The movie you just asked me about, we have now made. The, the, new, uh, the new Guillermo no, it's oh. just, uh, well, I mean, of course, anything Guillermo makes is a, is a life I was going to say, because I would feel like working with him, it'd be like, yeah, I can die now. Like, you know, <laughs> right, like, no, right, of course, I've of peaked. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, because the movie that we haven't made yet that, we, that was in has been in the works for eight years now 
uh, with Guillermo del Toro is, is Frankenstein, his version of Frankenstein, uh, which would be an so adaptation you just, from Mary. So you, you've just done that? No, we have not done that. that oh. that's, that's the one that I have not made, but I would love to. Oh, uh, that and, the, he's, uh, and that's been on the docket for a while? It's been on the docket for a while. It's been in development at Universal Pictures for quite some time, and uh, it, would be, it would be Guillermo del Toro adapting Mary Shelley's book. Uh, and, so wait, but so this hasn't been greenlit yet? Uh, no. How has this not been greenlit? Well, like, probably, what? Well, I, I don't, there's a, there could be many reasons for that. I don't know. I'm, oh not, I'm, I'm just uh, attached to play the monster. That's all I know. And I, oh, and my I'm, gosh. I'm absolutely that thrilled about be... it. But, but I, after eight years, I'm, you know, I'm still, I'm not holding my breath. So well, we'll I mean, more. at least the fantastic thing with playing Frankenstein is that, you know, the age is not going to be an issue. You'll be like, you know what? With every single day, I just get ripe and riper for this I role. I get better and better <laughs> for the part. That's Comes right. Comes a point where, you know, if it, like, takes 40 years, you'll be like, guys, just I don't even need makeup anymore. Like I'm right. good to go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the other one that, that I actually can check off my bucket list and, mm. and is a realized dream uh, was my dream of playing Count Orlock in a remake of Nosferatu. <gasps> yes, uh, yes. You, you see, you have so many great projects. I feel like I, we could do a six-hour show just discussing each of these projects. <laughs> no. And the talent attached, like you asked about, uh, our director, David Lee Fisher, was the same director who did the same process on the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari remake mm, that we did 10 years great ago. Great movie. Where he, where he used, uh, uh, we, we turned this silent film into a talkie. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but did it with a vintage old, old silent film look to it. Yeah. And we all, we all wore period costumes and, and had the same look as the original actors. And he plopped us into the original film footage by creating mat shots off the, the really? original Really? Yeah. I have to say, unfortunately, I haven't seen your version yet. I have seen the original. And yeah, um, it's the, one yeah. of my favorite movies just for that. Incre- the, in- the incredible creativity of that era where they were like, okay, we, you know, we're in um, wartime Germany. Mm-hmm. Electricity is rationed. How do we keep making movies? Oh, let's just paint the shadows on the set so it looks like lighting like I, to me that's just like it shows a measure of creativity and visually it was yeah. so stunning so stunning right. exactly so so the our version of the cabinet of dr caligari is out there i and then now nosferatu has been has been completed uh, we're going back in for some pickup shots soon <sighs> And then it should be hopefully done by October-ish of, uh, of this year. Um, wow. So, so do you have yeah. a release date yet, or is that kind of pending? I'm sorry? Do you have a release date yet, or is it pending? No, that would be a pending thing. I, yeah. Uh, it, it, <laughs> You're like, that's not my department. <laughs> and it's right. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I was able to um, work the object of my desire in that film, was mm. the role of Ellen, the young lady that uh, that would be the one. I, I would want to sink my teeth into the most, and the whole movie is about my, my journey to get to her. Oh, wow. Uh, is, uh, I was able to, um, to suggest and then work with my lovely co-star from Falling Skies, uh, Sarah Carter, who played mm-hmm. Maggie on our show for, for five years, and I was, on the, I was on Falling Skies for the final three years. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'd already worked together and already had trust build up, so it was, yeah. a, it was a very... When you're, when you're laying your teeth on someone's neck, uh, it's nice <laughs> to already have that discomfort of worked out. Yes, with, yes, you know? yes, I can, I can imagine. Um, yeah. Wow, it's like you have such a huge body of work. I just, it just seems to me like you must be working all the time. I mean, it's, it's insane. When someone looks at your IMDb page, I was like, okay, I'm scrolling, I'm still scrolling, I'm still <laughs> scrolling. Like, it's one of those, which is yeah. nice because a lot of act, other actors, I'm often surprised at actually how little work they've done. You know, like, you kind of think, oh, this person's a huge movie star, and then it's like, oh, but actually they've maybe only made eight or nine major movies. And with you, it's like, oh, my gosh, this guy's been working, like, <laughs> na- night and day. Yeah. Um so, Doug, if you could recommend a book for our listeners, um, maybe mm. something that's been really helpful in your filmmaking career or your, your career as an actor, what would it be and why? Mm. Um, a friend of mine, an actor friend of mine named Marcus Flanagan, uh, he, he's been, he comes a lot from the TV world. He's been a series regular on many shows over the years. He wrote a book uh, that that's a great advice for actors. It's called One Less Bitter Actor. <laughs> uh, I love it is, already. Right, I love so it One already. Less Bitter Actor, The Actor's Survival Guide. And that's uh, Marcus Flanagan. Um, uh, in it, it's just in, invaluable uh, references for uh, everything from, you know, it's, it's, it's taking us on his journey of, of but learning a lot about um, 
day-to-day business and and um, and the business side versus the creative side of acting yeah. and uh, and and how to get through it all without being that bitter actor who leaves and goes home, you know, stomping your feet. Yes. But, so yeah, and it's a, you know the audition process can be brutal, and he works through mm. that with with great humor and great insight. So yeah. I, that's a, it's a great book. And another book that I would also uh, mention for myself personally, and you have to work with me here. Uh, wait, wait for it. Uh, it would be the Holy Bible. Uh, you know, be... I have a lot of guests who mention that particular do, do, do book. They, is that it's right? a very popular book. Yes. And, and, and isn't it though? Uh, it's for, for, one of my favorites. Reason. For good reason. <laughs> well, you know, as an actor, we are so self-absorbed, and mm. uh, uh, and when you read. Um, uh, stories in the Bible about uh, humility and 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 the worship of of God, who is bigger and stronger and wiser than I am, and relying on Him and getting out of my selfishness. Uh, that seems to be a, just a, a more of a life lifelong a life lengthening sort of sort of material for me. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and also knowing knowing Bible stories and knowing. Uh, the, the life and times of Christ through the Gospels in the in the Bible, uh, you uh, you learn an awful lot of good, great references for movies, and you can, you can understand movie yeah. references. So many Christ-like characters and stories have been told on film, metaphorically. Mm. Uh, so when you play a character like the Silver Surfer, it came in very handy for me to know a lot about Jesus Christ as yeah. a as the figure that, that a character like that could be based on. Yeah, that, it's interesting. I've noticed a lot um, with doing analysis and, and consultancy on, on projects, um, <laughs> how helpful, how often I end up actually referring to biblical stories of saying mm-hmm. to, you know, kind of s- saying to filmmakers, do you realize actually this is this is the um, ancient story that you're telling. The story that you're telling right now is the story of Cain and Abel, or it's, you know, the story of Moses, or this is a Jesus savior kind of a story. Um, mm-hmm. Because the more that you can point to how that story is embedded in our culture's consciousness, I think the better people kind of understand why it has some real viability as a, as a story. And um, so I definitely feel that being that it has, purely for the fact that it has such a strong um, cultural relevance, it's something that people, irregardless mm-hmm. of their personal beliefs, should be fairly familiar with. It's um, definitely mm-hmm. worth reading at least once. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, <laughs> so um, Doug, if you could recommend a movie for our listeners, um, maybe something that uh, maybe even you have found really interesting for like creature work or something of the sort like that, what would it be and why? Right. Well, uh, I, uh, I I would refer to a movie I'm, that I'm in, which is which is so so uh, selfish of me. No, it's but, very reasonable. But but you know, when it comes to a movie like Pan's Labyrinth, I have to say that is the perfect movie. Uh, so uh, yes. Would, not yes. Only is it is it great for to watch as an audience member just to be entertained and be wowed by story or even a little scared, right? Because even it's kind scared, of scary. Right. It's a little creepy. Yes. Right. <laughs> But as a filmmaker or one who tells sto- the tellers of stories, I would I would refer them to watch Pan's Labyrinth because uh, it, it because it is the perfect movie. It it draws in um, elements of all types of genres. You've got mm. Spanish Civil War history. You've got personal relationship drama. You've got uh, uh, childhood fantasy fairy tale telling. Yeah. You've got ho- elements of horror film. So you you've got so many different things going on in that film. So many. It's a true. Uh, uh, exercise in layered storytelling and 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 having subtext and having l- yummy things to chew on. So yes. if you're a writer or a filmmaker, and the cinematography, the music, the acting. Oh, every the level sound of that movie design. Just, the sound design is it's yeah. just right. gorgeous. So so it, those six Oscar nominations that it got were well deserved, and and so anyone who who wants to make or be in films, I think that's that's the perfect movie to watch. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, so, Doug, I know you mentioned that when you started out your career, um, there was there was no internet. There was, you know, mm-hmm. it was kind of like, hey, we get a periodical once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, now, these days, there's a plethora of um, online resources for actors that I think a lot of the time some of the younger actors don't realize just how fortunate they are. Because I, too, remember the days before, um, you know, trying to book acting gigs 
without the internet. And um, I actually mm -hmm. used to sit in my parents' basement with like the phone directory and yeah. just like cold call people and be like, you know, like anyone who vaguely might have something to do with film, just cold calling them and be like, hey, my name's Vanessa, I wanna be an actress. And it's like, I tell the story to young actors now who are kind of like, oh, my agent isn't doing much for me. And I'm like, you have no idea. You could go to a dozen websites right now right. and start making right. connections with people. You have no excuse. Um, so no, no, right, exa exactly, because no, I'm, I'm from your era. Well, you know, with the, the picking up the phone and trying yeah. to make, meet people. You have no you idea, you have no anything. idea what that person has done. You have no way of checking it up. You mm -hmm. have no idea what they look like, any mm -hmm. of the sort. And you just kind of are like throwing, chucking stuff out there and just hoping that something takes. Um, <laughs> but all that said, um, being that we do now live in this incredibly resourceful era, um, do you have a website or an app that you would recommend to our listeners as being something that you have found really helpful to your mm. acting career? Um, well, I know that there are uh, young actors starting out. Uh, I know that the, the, uh, they tend to tend to use sites like Actors Access or LA Casting quite a bit for uh, you know finding out. Uh, again, going that's some you can find out breakdowns in what's being cast without having to, to go through an agent, um, where you can, can uh, have access to to uh, casting notices directly. And mm. you can submit yourself on your own, uh, like and then take things into your own hands, like you just said. Yeah. Um, I have not used those sites myself, just because um, the because they you're Doc about, Jones. <laughs> well, they, well, they came about after I had the, the, an agent in place, yeah. uh, who was taking care of all that for me. So, uh, and 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 uh, you know, and I don't want to boast or anything, but but a lot of the roles I get come looking for me now. Yes, so I would like, imagine. I would imagine not, that you have rather more offers than you could ever. But, it, but you do, but you know, and then thank you. But it's a, it's a, uh, so no matter where you're at, there's, there's, a, yeah, that, there's a whole game to play with that too. Mm. You know, when the offers come, you need to read a script and that assess is that the right thing yeah. for you and all that. Um, but I think a, a very resourceful, a very, a very great resource that we all use, whether whether you're a movie watcher or a movie maker, everyone uses imdb.com. Yeah. Everyone does. Yeah. Um, and so if you, uh, when you get to imdb.com, you can also you know, pay a little bit of money per month and uh, and join IMDb Pro, mm. which gives you access to um, facts and figures that are not available to the to the to the uh, casual user. Yes, and and that would include things like um, uh, what's in development and who's making that, who's producing that, who's mm. writing that, who's directing that movie that's in development. So you can maybe maybe get uh, access to if uh, for, for instance, a friend of mine recently uh, was was looking in. He's seven feet tall, and he and he knows <laughs> his his strength is being a seven foot tall agile athletic actor wow. who can do roles that no one else can do yeah well there was a movie looking for someone about his type and he knew that um that uh, that that him bothering people over the phone would not be a bother but would be an answer to prayer right yes so, yeah so absolutely he went on imdb pro he looked up the project he got phone numbers and and contact information from who's involved got to a casting office got to a creature effects shop got to he he got had access to all that by by just making calls and, and getting referrals and one and and seven steps along the way now he's waiting to hear back from the production of whether he's cast or not. So yeah. <laughs> IMDb Pro is what what allowed him to to do all that. Absolutely, so I'm a big fan of that. Absolutely, and it's like. Uh, maybe 15 bucks a month. I mean, it's to where even the brokest of actors can mm -hmm. scrape together that money. And, mm -hmm. and truly, it can do for you what a few years ago one could only do with an agent. So it kind of mm -hmm. really opens up the playing field tremendously. Right. Um, well, Doug, it's time for the martini shot. What parting piece of guidance do you want to share with us? Uh, a couple things. Uh, let's say one would be, as an actor, stop getting tattoos yes oh my gosh doug i'm gonna start flipping screaming down the microphone at this point because <laughs> i oh my gosh i just have been having this conversation with some actors this week of just saying mm -hmm. it is such a nightmare as a producer however much actors say oh i'm putting it somewhere we don't see if you are a guy mm -hmm. you are going to end up taking your shirt off at some point if you're a leading mm -hmm. man and mm -hmm. none of us want to spend three hours a day taking you know makeup putting makeup on right. you i had a shoot where they put makeup on him and during the shoot was a very physical um mm -hmm. uh fight scene 
And so through. he's sweating, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we literally, I get the footage back and it's like, you can see half of that tattoo. Mm -hmm. And then you're faced with a situation of, oh, so now we have to like paint that out. I mean, it's, yeah, right. sorry. This is like, you have just hit a, a nerve. Right, your, 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 your tattoos, um, even though they are coverable, it still costs time and money, and yes. if they have the option between you and another actor, yes. they're going to go with the other one that doesn't yes. cost them that time and money. Sorry, Doug, they're going to do I'm, it. Doug, I'm going to, like, save this, record this, and just, like, send this to my actor friends and be like, <laughs> please, if you won't listen to me, will you please listen to Doug Jones? Because I'm right, telling okay, you, <laughs> this is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. It's, a, it's a, like a epidemic within the acting community where it's like yeah. we want actors to be canvases right mm -hmm. like if right. we want that character to have a tattoo we will paint it on you we don't right. want to start the right. day having to paint stuff off of if you if the canvas already comes painted you, you can only use it one way yeah That's right. no exactly That's right. exactly so, I, <laughs> so aside from that i would also say uh every every actor needs to in this day and age now especially now uh, you need to be adept at using your social media. Yes. Um, uh, more job opportunities come through that than you would ever guess. Mm. And, uh, and, and the networking that happens through there and just the visibility there. There are even people, if you're an unknown actor now, uh, in a casting session, they will ask you, what are your social media numbers? Who do you? How many followers do you yeah. have on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Oh, I always check it. Like right. every project that I've worked on in mm -hmm. you know the the last few years, mm -hmm. it's a conversation at some point. And as you said, if you've got right. choice between actor A who has like you know his mom as his fan, mm -hmm. or you've got actor B who has even a hundred thousand fans, right? right. It's, it could be the deciding factor. It can, it ha can and has been, exactly. Mm. And also, when it comes to uh, what makes that attractive to the producers as well, is that when the movie comes out, you'll be talking about it, hopefully. Yeah. And it's even been worked into my contract before on some jobs where I am obligated to <laughs> send out so many uh, tweets yeah. or Facebook or Instagram posts Absolutely. about that project. Right. Absolutely. Right. So, I um I actually did a, a show um this week with Meg DeAngelis, who's a massive YouTube star. She's got I think like four or five million uh YouTube subscribers. She's oh, got heaven. um yeah. something like one point three Instagram one point three million Instagram fans. And she's done this movie uh with YouTube Red's platform, which kind of speaks to the point you were making earlier about emerging platforms. Mm -hmm. And so we had this conversation where I'm saying to her, you know, because she's now like, you know, it's one of the first movies she's made in her career. And she's already, you know, her next movie that comes out is with... Um, is with uh, like um, Gwen Stefani and mm -hmm. Anna Kendrick and like some huge, huge, huge names. Sure. And I was saying to her, well, you know, do you think that that has, is that part of the conversation that you have with producers? And she was saying, you know, in a lot of cases, yes, very much. It's, you know, it's kind of a bit of a, uh, you know, it's kind of a package deal that they're not, uh, admittedly, they're looking at her acting because she was making a very good point of if her acting sucks, like they're not going to tank the project just because of her. Just they want of numbers, yeah. yeah, just because of numbers. But it makes a big difference when it you sure can does. bring that kind of, of basically free marketing to a project. It sure does, right. All right. So, so even recently, um, uh, an actress friend of mine uh, was telling me about during pilot season last year, she had became down between her and another young lady for this role on a major network show, uh, a new pilot that there was being, being cast, and the other girl got it because of her humongous YouTube following. Yeah. Right? And she did not have nearly the acting resume that my friend did, mm. uh, but uh, but because she has really popular fart videos or whatever, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that that tipped the scale like, in her favor. Lord, please don't let us get to the point where it's like Kim Kardashian is starring in every movie. I just can't. Well, I that's know, I when know, I'm leaving well, the industry, right? <laughs> right that, well, that, that's when we need to, you know, make our own YouTube channel that, that yes. has content on it that, that's of, of yes. value. There Fight you go. Fight back against the Kardashians is my. That's advice. right. That's right. But, yeah, no, but, we, we, but you, with that, with that whole conversation though about the new media, you can indeed yeah. create your own content, and uh, and then so many people have been have been discovered because of their their very successful yeah. YouTube shows yeah. or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Well, 
you know, Justin Bieber, maybe he's out there listening to this somewhere. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, right, maybe. Um, well, that's a wrap. Film Talk Nation in this industry, you're only as good as the people you know. And today you've been hanging out with Doug Jones and myself. If you want to go the extra mile, head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type Doug Jones into the search bar. The show notes from today's show will appear along with everything we discussed, like Doug's recommended book and movie. Doug, we appreciate you sharing your prices insight with us today. Film Talk Nation thanks you, and we'll see you on the red carpet. Thanks so much for having me.